Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. It has been wonderful to, to be here thus far. Um, that part of me that Brother Mark mentioned, the, the pit in the stomach, the recognize, recognizing my failings and praying for deliverance, that part of me is, doesn't think it's so wonderful right now. But, nevertheless, there's a part of me that longs to speak in the name of my Lord if He'll give me the grace to do so, longs to impart upon you some spiritual gift. As Paul said, that doesn't come from me. I'm not the gift giver. Um, but if I can impart the gift of the Lord unto you, then that is something I'd consider wonderful. Um, it's a wonderful blessing that I have and very thankful to be able to attempt to do so, but prayerful that the Lord will give grace. Um, it's, it's been on our hearts and minds to be here with you and have uh, felt that the attempt to come up to the house of the Lord has been blessed. Our Lord is so gracious to bless us in spite of ourselves, in spite of um, how many times that we have uh, failed to walk in His paths, how many times we, in an individual basis, have failed to walk worthy of the vocation where with we are called, that yet the Lord does again deliver um, when we come seeking His face. And the, the problem I have is that I do not continually seek His face, but when He allows me to turn to Him, when He allows me to put aside myself and look to Him, He's gracious to um, receive those that come seeking His face. This morning in the song service when Elder Hewlin led Sweet Hour of Prayer, Brother Hewlin, when we got to the part that he, we sing, um, and since he bid me seek his face, um, that got to me this morning because that's what we've come to do, to seek his face. And it's not our idea. He bid us to do so. Um, and there's a psalm where he says, where the psalmist writes, um, Thou hast said to me, Seek my face. And the answer was, Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. That should be my answer all the times of my life. Um, sadly, it's not, but it should be something that we desire in our lives is to see the face of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we will not see Him with this natural eye in this life. We will not be able to behold that beautiful face with these natural eyes while we yet walk in this world and in this sinful flesh. But someday we'll see Him as He is when we will be like Him. But until then, He has not left us um, without His face. He has not left us in a place where we do not have the ability to approach under His throne. We sing songs about throne of grace. It's one of my favorite songs that we sing because... The music is beautiful, but mostly because um, we have a throne of grace where we can go. And without that throne of grace, um, I know you feel the same way. I could not live in this life. I could not walk in this world without the, the ability, by the merit of the blood of Jesus Christ and the grace afforded us by our Lord God, I would not be able to walk in this life. Um, I know you feel the same way when the things come down, pressing down upon us, when the, the things of this life weigh down on us, um, those things from without and then certainly from within ourselves, our own sinful nature that fights against our, um, our inward man to the point that um, the weak part of us just sometimes wants to lay it down, but that inward man is not weak. 
That inward man will never lay down his arms, but how many times do we allow the flesh to rule in our lives? How many times do we neglect the command of the Lord and the instructions of Paul when he says to yield not ourselves um, to the flesh? That um, I've tried to preach on that, that, that you're dead in, um, Christ, uh, this, in Colossians chapter uh, 2. That ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, and to, so mortify therefore the deeds of the flesh. That we're told to do that. We're told um, how to be able to live in this life um, and not be wearied by the things of this life, and not be um, downcast by them. But when we don't heed those instructions, that's when we are wearied and downcast by the things of this world. Uh, Brother Mark mentioned this morning about parents. I've been I've mentioned that at Grace a few times lately. You know, coincidentally, um, you you preach what you know, and though I don't know very much, my life circumstance provides me a lot of per, uh, you know parental e examples. I I don't know a lot about farming. In fact, I don't know anything about farming. Um, I've never farmed anything, nor can I keep a plant alive in my yard. <laughs> So it's hard for me to preach about plowing the rug. I'm just being honest. It, it, gets, it would be disingenuous for me to try to preach about plowing a straight rug. I've never plowed anything. Um, but I've tried, by the grace of God, to raise children so far. And while failing miserably, I'm learning some things. I'm not learning how to do it better. I'm learning some things about God. See, God gives us things in life that are meant to teach us about Him and about our relationship with Him and about what He's done for us. God has given us examples in nature to teach us of Him. And we're to, we are supposed to look at those and see Him. Um, he tells us in the Bible things, naturally speaking, that are meant to point to Him. And He doesn't um, leave it vague. Some of the parables are a little vague, but for the most part, for His disciples that seek His face, He makes it plain to us if we will look. And when He tells Nicodemus, and I, I've preached a whole, I've tried to preach a whole sermon on this, but I won't today. When He tells Nicodemus, you must be born again, the Lord Jesus Christ invented birth. You know, put it that way. He created natural birth. And He knows full well what birth is. And He knows that those born never choose Him. So he did not use a bad example, as I am prone to do. He used a perfect example that those born of God, it was the action of God that made us born of God. Uh, that who, which were born not of the, I always miss something in this, not of the um, will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, nor not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. I hope I got all the... the I, I know I can get it right if I say this. Which were born of God, nothing else. Um, if I can just summarize it, I'll get it right that way. We're born of God just as your children are born of you. Your parent, parents bear children and they don't ask their permission or ask them to accept their parentage. Um, prince William is a prince by birth and Princess uh, Catherine is still just married into the family. Um, she... We are married into the family. We're adopted into the family. But we're born of God. And we didn't choose our family of God. He gave us that illustration. When He told us we're dead in sins, He didn't um, use a bad analogy. Dead is dead. And we're supposed to look at natural death and see what's, what dead in sins means. That we can't recover ourselves from that. There have been people brought back from what we would have called dead, medically speaking, but those people didn't revive themselves either. It took an outside force to revive them. No one ever just brings himself from the dead, say Jesus Christ, and in that case it still says God rose him up. Um, natural illustrations should teach us about God when we're given children. And when we are trying to raise children, we should see some things that teach us the spiritual lessons that we need to know. We need to see God in our lives. Uh, when we have marriages, we should see God in that marriage because it was um, instituted by God to teach us of Christ and His bride. And as um, 
another minister that not me and not printed Baptist said, and it was related to me by my, my wife, um, who she went to this wedding. I said, I wish I could have came up with that. It was this, that, that since marriage is, is a picture of Christ in the church, then when people look at our marriage, they should see Christ and the church. That means we need to live a marriage that portrays Christ and the church. Um, and there's a lot to that. But what I want to get all of this that I'm saying out of is, God has given us how to live this life. Um, how to live in a way that seeks His face, in a way that allows us to trudge on through this world, and not just to trudge on, but to walk boldly and victoriously in this life. He is a parent who did not leave his children without instruction. You know, as a parent, you try to raise your children. You, you do the best you can, but here's the main thing you want. Well, if, if nothing else, you just expect two things of them. Um, that I expect a lot of my children, but it boils down to two. It boils down to do what we tell you to do, and do not do what we tell you not to do. Now, if you'll handle those two things, you'll really cover it all. But we, as a child, I know I didn't. Um, amen. Just keep them. Keep them <laughs> but I know I didn't, and I know they don't, but that's all we expect. God did not. He wasn't one of these bad parents that, that would go around and give his children everything they want to where they're spoiled. God does not give us everything we want in this life. Thank be, thanks be to God that He does not give us the, our every desire of this flesh. It would ruin us as sure as um, anything can be ruined. God gives us, as a good parent does, good things. The, I have a text of hope, but um, this isn't it. But Jesus Himself says that you, as parents, which of you, and when your child asks for bread, gives them a stone? Nobody does that. Or which of you, as a parent, when gives them a serpent? Um, that's just, no one would ever think as a good parent to do that. But then he tells us this. Well then, you being evil, if you know how to give good things to your children, how much more God, the all-wise, all-loving, all-gracious and merciful God that is our Father, does not give bad gifts unto His children. He does not give inappropriate gifts to His children. He doesn't give us the sugary things of life that will rot the teeth. Understand the metaphor. He gives us good, nutritious things and things we need in this life. If you get something bad, it didn't come from God. Um, it, when it, The text that says every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above, that to me not only includes the good, it, it um it excludes any bad that every good gift and every perfect gift. And therefore, no bad gifts or imperfect gifts. Nothing that God doesn't give unto us. Um, evil, troublesome things. He gives us correction that our flesh calls troublesome sometimes and evil to us. But He doesn't give us bad things. He gives us the tools we need for this life. And He gave them to us in the inward man and in his word. Now the text I want to read to you is in James chapter 5. Oh, that's in Peter, so it may not be chapter 5. It is though. Um, James chapter 5, verse 7. James writes, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the pr uh, precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who had spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction, for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. 
But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be nay, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. And there's a much more reading we could do here as instruction to us about praying, and I want to, but I'm going to uh, hold off reading. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. That's what this life is. Understand, we are here for a purpose. We have a reason to be here. Man has tried um, for all the generations of this world to come up with a uh, meaning of life outside of the purpose and will of God. But you will fail every time you try to come up with a meaning of life outside of God. Since God created all life, He is the meaning of life. He is the source of life. And, um, and we're told by Solomon in his writing, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What matter? His writing, yes. The Bible, yes. And even our lives. The conclusion of the whole matter. So fear God and keep His commandments. Um, this is the whole duty of man. This is our life. It's to keep the commandments of God, to respect and reverence Him, fear Him, and to seek His face because He's given us that ability. Um, as a child, um, you would not be, a, a, you can obey your parents and never seek their face, but that isn't what you want as a child. You desire to, to embrace your parents and, and with their approval and with pleasing them. Be patient, therefore, unto the coming of the Lord. That's this life. We are to be patient in this life unto, toward, looking toward the coming of the Lord. We heard this morning about the Lord's coming again to take us home. He is coming, brethren, to take us home. But He is here with us today. He is in you, as we heard. He is with us. He walks this life with us. Um, he gives us His face here and He's coming again. Those are the, the two things that allow us to be patient toward and to the coming of the Lord. But what is patience? It is a cheerful endurance. It's not just an endurance, but a cheerful endurance. And as I know Mark has uh, preached before on enduring, enduring isn't just suffering for a little while and giving up. Enduring is to the completion or the fulfillment of. And we'll hopefully go to that text. He says, Be ye patient like that husbandman, which is the natural example of patience. The husbandman doesn't just plant his field. Now, again, I don't know anything about farming, but I've read something. He doesn't just plant a field and then go inside and watch his sports and whatever he does until it's time to harvest. The, I know this, I don't want to farm because of how much labor he has to put into it. Patience is not sitting back and waiting for something to happen. Patience is cheerfully enduring what you have to endure toward the goal that you are looking for. And it involves something that will that will um, pull out of you that uh, ability to endure. And in the text in Hebrews that I want to look at, it's joy. Um, we are given an example of how to endure in this life. We're told the prophets um, endured. We're told Job endured. Um, we're supposed to look at them as an example. And in Hebrews chapter 11, 12. Um, after hearing in Hebrews chapter 11 of all of those who had faith, who by faith, through faith, who had faith, who um, pleased God. And we had that testimony of them, that good report they had, um, that as it's called, a hall of fame of faith. But the point, brethren, is those men had nothing you do not have. They did not have inside their inward man a super faith that we aren't endowed with by the Holy Spirit of God in regeneration. They had the same faith that you and I have today if indeed we are born of the Spirit of God and I believe that we are. Which means God gave them the tools to do what they needed to endure in this life and He's given us the same tools to endure what we need to endure in this life as well. Uh, we're told in um, James that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. You know, passions, uh, we use that word kind of as something you love, 
But when you think about the passion, like Christ was um, seen after His passion, and then there was that movie they made about it. it I didn't know it when I was a child, but it means sufferings. Um, Elijah went through the same sufferings we go through. He wasn't a man who um, didn't have it easy all his life. And if you read his life, you find he didn't um, endure nonstop. He didn't persevere um, all the way. He um, got despondent and he got down on, on things. And he basically thought it would be better if he just died. Uh, that the Lord wasn't going to deliver him anymore. But the Lord showed him that he has not left us without the things we need. And He hasn't left us without a company of witnesses. And here in Hebrews chapter 12, He says, Wherefore, for the reason being, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You know, they had their cloud of witnesses around them. Elijah had his, uh, the answer being that right then, right there, God had reserved about 7,000 who have not bowed the knee. All of these who died in faith, they weren't alone in this world. They had their companions that followed God. And we also, look about you. Think on the ones that we love in distant places. We are not um, alone in this world. We may feel alone sometimes. Um, the, the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. But even when you feel alone, think on Zion. Think on the church because you are not alone in this life. You're given um, the people we need to look to as a witness. Think on the, the blessings of the, uh, in the lives of people you know and love. Um, the tragedies of the tornadoes we've just recently heard of in um, Alabama and, and all those places, especially Alabama. You know the report I, I've been getting of the way the Lord's blessed the people in Alabama. People look at tragedies of this world and when they look at it they say, where was God in that? Well, I'll tell you where He was. He was with every one of those people that were spared from those things. That's where God was. He wasn't in the destruction. He was in the sparing of His people. And um, from the report I've heard, that only material things were damaged. Um, what a blessing that is, is that um, we can replace those things, but the, He spared His people. You know, even if someone were to die... That person has been spared from this world. We know and hope that if we pass away in this life, then to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that's a deliverance as well. Look to the witnesses God has given us. But most of all, it says, to run this race, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. See, he had a joy set before him when he endured that cross. He didn't just go up there to uh, endure the cross and see what would come out of it. He went with the purpose, knowing the joy that was set before him, and that was the entire family of God, that they would be with him as was his will. He chose us, loved us before the foundation of the world, and so he was able to endure to the finish of that cross and the completion of redemption for His people because of the joy that He looked to, the joy set before Him. Well, brother, we have a joy set before us. We can endure the things of this life if we look to the joy set before us. That is a tool that we have in this life. The joy set before us. What is the joy that's set before us? Um, the joy set before us, uh, in one, uh, when Jesus was born in this world, um, the, the, the angel said that, um, fear not, for I come, um, mm, you hear it all the time, you know, fear not, for I, uh, behold, I bring to you uh, good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Why? Because the Savior was born in Bethlehem that day. That's the joy that we have to set before us. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, who endured. Our joy is the one who endured for us. And, he, and we were His joy. Well, He is our joy. We look to Him and we're able to endure this um, life. We're able to endure. And if we do endure in this life, you know, when we see someone endure, we count them happy that endure. Um, you don't count someone that is suffering happy, but you count someone who's finished suffering happy. And that's what enduring is. Um, we have suffering and tribulation in this life. We have mountains that come on us. 
but looking to the joy we can get through the tribulations of this life. Jesus Himself said, In this world you shall have tribulation, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. Our joy has overcome this world. And He's given us the victory. What did James write in... What else did James write in that text? He wrote that you know... Get back to it. He says, You have heard of the patience of Job. And he says, And have seen the end of the Lord. What does that mean? The Lord has an end? No. You've seen in your life, through the Word of God and through the preaching of the Gospel, we've seen the end of the Lord. Or in other words, the intended outcome. The thing that He has accomplished. The joy that we have is set before us is the end of the Lord. The end He has brought about. Um, His end for us. You know, it says in Isaiah, uh, He is um, God, there's none like Him. There's God, there's none else. Uh, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times of things not yet done. Saying, My counsel shall stand and I shall do all my good pleasure. Call it, uh, just keep it. That's talking about what Jesus would accomplish. And declaring the end from the beginning, the way I see that is to say, not just that He saw the end, from the beginning. Not just that He knew what the end would be from the beginning, but that He has been telling us, declaring to us, what that end is since the very beginning when He covered Adam and Eve with coats of skin, He declared the end right there. And even today, in the preaching of the Gospel, He declares the end. He's been declaring the end from the beginning, ever since the beginning. And we know and have seen the end of the Lord. It's like if we're watching a sporting event and we already have known the outcome, why would we fear? Why would we wonder if our team's going to be victorious if we've already seen the end? Brethren, we in this life, no matter what we're going through, we've seen the end of the Lord. We have, you've seen it. You know the end. Um, why should we fear? Why should we not be able to endure that joy that we have? The end of the Lord is ours. He's already given us the victory. Um, and you've seen, it says, and that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Pitiful, full of pity, compassionate is what that means. Loving kindness He's had for us. We didn't just hear about it. We've seen it. We felt it. He's shown Himself to us as a loving and compassionate God. Um, merciful unto us. Um, uh, what did Peter say? that To desire the sincere milk of the Word. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You've felt that in your life, have you not? You've felt the loving kindness and the, the loving compassion the Lord has for you. Those are the joyful things that we can look to to endure in this life. He's also given us another tool um, by where we can endure the things in this life. And that is, He's given every one of His children of God this. Not a single one of His children do not have, are lacking. If born again of the Spirit of God, you are not lacking this. Now there's a lot in that fruit of the Spirit um, that I cannot touch because I want to try to close. But, you know, I've just talked about joy. Um, we preached a whole sermon on love, peace, uh, long-suffering. I want to talk about faith. He has given us faith. Now, faith itself will take two or three sermons as well. But I want to try to keep it as simple as I can understand. I want to try to make faith something that um, I can lay hold on. And a tool that I can use. Okay? Faith is not believing. Believing has to involve faith. Believing, true believing cannot come from any place except faith. But faith is not believing. Faith is a total confidence in the truthfulness of God. Faith is so strong that we never use faith the way it can be used. Faith is a tool that we have. Faith has been given to us in the inward man. But we do not all exercise faith to the level that um, it, we have. It, it, we do not utilize faith in a way that we could and 
get through the things in this life. When we get despondent, we are not using our faith. That's just that simple. Uh, faith is a total confidence and trusting in the faith and the truth of God. And that what God has promised, He will bring to pass. Now what God has promised, we just talked about is the end of the Lord. He's promised that. And if we believe that to the utmost and stand firm on that, what can possibly get us um, despondent in this life? If we really look, lay, our, uh, lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven instead of this life, what could bring us down? If we truly consider that we're victorious in Christ and that heaven someday is our home, if, to the level we believe that and, and trust in that, that's the exact uh, level of not caring about this world that we'll have. Now, the, to the level that we do not rest in that, that's the level of fear and um, you know, despondency in this life when trials come that we'll have. Faith is given to us, but we must use it in this life to endure the things of this life. And there's a lot more about faith that I'd have to lay out, but just understand that every child of God has it. No one is lacking it. And there's a place in Matthew chapter 17, I believe, where the disciples themselves... They seem to want more faith. They, um, Mark 17. Thank God, I knew there was a 17. I think Luke 17 has something very similar. I remember thinking 17. I remember 17. Um, I sure love when I have a good brother here who can get me in the right place as fast as possible. Um, And, and then my thumbs don't allow it. If I'm not mistaken, though, Luke, it speaks of a sycamore tree. But in the other place that I'm trying to look for, where the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Increase it. Um, it's as if they're saying, Lord, what you've given us is not enough. We need more from you. Brethren, the Lord has not um, left us lacking in what we need to serve Him. Now we can go back to the Old Testament as well and see where He commanded the things of the, of the Old Testament law where he commanded that his uh, disciples, um, or that the Lord commanded Israel all those things in the law. Told Moses, make sure you make it after the pattern shown me in the mount. Um, and then he told them what to make. And he told them to bring all the things that they needed to make it gold and shit and wood. And all those things we heard of this morning um, from the ark. You know when he told them to do that, they had that stuff. Where did they get that? Were they naturally wealthy? No, they had been slaves. They had been slaves in Egypt. But when they left Egypt, they spoiled Egypt. The, Egypt gave them all of that riches by which the Lord would then command them to make the things for the tabernacle and the, the law. They didn't gain that wealth. The Lord gave that to them and they were to use it for the Lord. They were not to use it like they did, which was use that gold to make a golden calf. Um, they were to use it for His purpose, and He told them to bring it as a free offering. You notice in the Old Testament, even under the law, they were to voluntarily give those things. And then when they brought all of that gold and silver and wood and everything they needed, if you go and read this, the, the ones that were to make those things said, tell Moses to tell them to leave off giving it. Because what they had brought, it says, was much more than enough to do that which the Lord commanded. The Lord has given us, trust me, more than enough to follow Him in, his, in this life. To uh, endure the things of this life. He's given you more than enough. Don't be like the disciples in that say, increase what we need. We have all we need. And what we have is faith. And the Lord told them, if you have faith, 
as of the grain of a mustard seed. You can say to this mountain, be thou removed, and it would be removed. Now, was he saying that by faith we can take a mountain, physical mountain and throw it in the sea? I don't think that's the point. Very seldom is the Lord going to say something like that, and no one has ever done it in history. I think the Lord meant for us to understand that we have mountains in this life that come up against us. We have things that we have to climb. We have things we have to endure. And we have trials and tribulations, but He's given us faith. And you don't need to increase your faith. You need to use your faith. In Isaiah, and I'll close with this text here, which I probably should have started with, but in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14, God says, Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. And that's us, brethren. We are the not spiritual Israel, spiritual Jews, um, born again of, the, of God. It says, Fear not, I will help thee, said the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. A threshing instrument. I was talking in the car with Ann about this. We don't know what this is like. Um, we were talking about rice, driving through some rice fields, and turns out I use the technology we have today, and I Googled it. I don't know anything about rice except you three minutes and you got it. Um, <laughs> It's, we have missed so much in our modern day of understanding things because we don't do these things. Used to, in the day, to eat grain, you had to do some work. Uh, you know when God said, if a man does not work, he shall not eat? That's because they pretty much had to work if they wanted to eat any grain or bread or cereal. And that's because when it grows, you can't pick it like you can a fruit and just eat it. Grains have to be worked, and the way you work it is called threshing. And threshing is taking a instrument, um, usually some kind of flail or some other thing, like a whip almost, and it's got metal, but and you beat the grain until something called chaff, which you probably heard of, um, falls off of it. But that's not enough. Then it has to be tossed up into the air. And what happens is the chaff is light, the stuff you don't eat around the grain, and it blows away, but the grain falls back down. And that's just the mechanics of it, okay? But that's important to know, or else we read this and we don't understand what's happening. Um, in this life, now there's a lot of things that we can apply to that. The devil uh, desires to have thee, to sift thee as wheat. What does that mean? Well, it means the devil desires to take us and toss us around like you would toss a basket of wheat. And he ain't doing it so the bad stuff goes away. He's doing it to toss us around. And we can't always mix all these types. But the devil desires to sift ye as wheat and to toss you around. But the Lord said, but I've prayed for thee. He said that to Peter, but that applies to you and me. The Lord prayed for us. He prays for us today. He intercedes for us. But He's given us a threshing tool. He's given us a threshing tool, and I believe it's faith. And He's given this tool for us, and it has sharp teeth. It'll do the job. And what it's meant to, to, to beat and thresh says, Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and fanning is the act of tossing the grain into the air to make the... Um, Chaff blow away. It says, Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. And then verse 17 on is beautiful, but I'm going to not get it because I'm closing. Um, the Lord's given us faith, and we have mountains and hills in our lives. Mountains are greater than hills. Um, Yes, they are. And it doesn't say that the faith, that if we use the faith, that we will have no mountains or hills. But what it does say is the hills or the mountains, the big things that we have to come up against, that by utilizing faith in our lives, and that is trusting in the Lord with all our heart, not just believing that the mountain will go away, but trusting that the Lord has given us everything we need. Um, we can beat that mountain down to where it's manageable in our lives. We can endure it. 
And the hills, the little things that get under us, the little things that, that just seem to drag us down, but they're really not important when we look at it, we can make those as if they're just chaff and blow them away. Um, we can use joy and faith in our lives and all the other things I didn't talk about to endure the things of this life looking to the coming of the Lord when one day when He comes, there won't be any mountains, there won't be any hills, we won't need to endure anything anymore. We will be with Him forever. And until that day, let us endure with patience this life. Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.